When I started lecturing eight years ago, it was the research was showing 10 to 15 percent of people proceeded to PCS. Now the estimates are higher, up to 30 percent I've seen in some research. People that get a mild traumatic brain injury go on to get chronic unresolving symptoms that last for more than 30 days. Here are some of the things we that we do know. There's a lot we don't, but here are some things we do know. Neck damage, autonomic dysfunction, metabolic endocrine and blood flow dysfunction, uh, psych psychological factors, lower pre-injury cognitive reserve. This is exactly what I was just talking about. This is one of the factors. What was happening before the injury? And persistent inflammation. And so there's the researchers, actually, this is from McMaster University, my alma mater in the Toronto area, coined post-inflammatory brain syndrome is maybe a bit more accurate. It still has that in syndrome because we don't 100% know yet, but it probably is a more accurate description of what's happening in PCS. The endocrine connection. So this is something I have not talked about yet, but it applies both to acute but usually to unresolving cases. There's a Dr. Mark Gordon. He's from the US. I believe California, and his big crusade has been about helping do other doctors understand the dysfunction from an endocrine level that TBI wreaks on the body. And there's research in more severe concussion and, and severe brain injury that up to 75% of people get some sort of endocrine dysfunction. And in mild traumatic brain injury, I've seen somewhere in the 15% category, whether it's kids or adults. There's a recent study on kids I was just looking at earlier this week. And they found that up to even a year after the injury, it doesn't happen right away, but the damage to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus via inflammatory signals, via blood flow disruption, via, via oxidative damage, occurs insidiously over a period of time. And these deficiencies start showing up 6, 12 months later. This is what makes it so difficult to diagnose, is that people are like, I'm just all of a sudden really tired. What happened last year? I don't really know. I, 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 I think I was OK. When you start digging into their history, I ask, was there ever a brain injury that happened? Yeah, you know what? I did really slip and fall on the ice. I had a headache for a couple weeks, and then it went away. It was fine. But then you start looking back and you start looking at their blood work and they notice prolactin levels are really elevated. Growth hormone levels are really deficient. Thyroid levels, TSH is super low, but their T3 and T4 is kind of normal or sub subclinical low. So that, these are all signs that the pituitary hormones are not being properly produced. So this is a, there's a lot of research now coming out about this and I'm gonna end off with my last case on this and hopefully we don't Get, I don't get derailed here with time. So this is just a quick review of uh, the potential hormones that can be affected. Number one, growth hormone. Number two, thyroid. Number, two, uh, number three, pituitary. Those are the three most common ones in the literature. Okay, so in summary, you have the ATP deficiency, a hypometabolism that happens, excitotoxicity, neuroinflammation, dysautonomia, these are all connected together. It's not in one in isolation. And when I talk about drugs next, this is the one reason that you can see consistent failure on using medications that address one specific area. It doesn't address the complete cascade. Blood flow issues, leaky blood brain, and endocrine. Okay, so for the next section, I kind of want to just use the context of a case. So one of my patients saw a couple years ago, and I'm a big fan of understanding the person and not the label the person comes in with. Dr. William Osler is one of the pioneers of modern medicine. There's a whole hospital network in the Toronto area that was named after him. And I think this is something our pioneers in medicine really had appreciation for. In my, in my world, it, it's functional medicine. I don't know, I, I heard functional neurology is something you're all familiar with. We're very, we're, we have to understand the biochemistry, but we also have to also understand the patient. What is the patient telling you? The patient will often tell you where you need to go, in my experience. I'm gonna show you this with, with uh, we'll call her Anita. Okay, so this person is a, uh, was a sailor. Um, she was competing in races all over Canada, around the world. She got hit in the back of the head with a boom of the sail. Didn't have any issues. 
Then, four days later, she was doing something in her kitchen, stood up and hit the back of her head. Something that normally wouldn't have an issue for most people. That's when she got the 10 out of 10 headache. Went to the hospital, got assessed with a CT scan, all normal. Trouble sleeping, screens bothered her. She tried acupuncture because she was seeing acupuncture for some MSK issues. Acupuncture made her worse. Does anyone see that before? I've heard of that before. I see it actually often enough in my practice. People that are in high sympathetic overdrive and a dysregulation of autonomic issues, they are already at a state of hyper awareness of any sort of stimuli. So if you start, especially the Western model of like dry needling into like the occipitals, I see patients have an exaggerated sympathetic and autonomic aggravation. So they might feel more nauseous. They might feel the symptoms come on worse. So we have to be careful. So I usually start with auricular acupuncture. There's a nerve of the vagus nerve that innervates the ear. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, I do a little bit of a screener in my, uh, in my practice, came out. Uh, Pretty normal, headache was her main symptoms. Background, low TSH, she had eczema. That may or may not be related, we'll see. So I already mentioned like that. So she was using Advil to deal with her headache. So let's talk about that. So she started using um, medication. Let's look at what the current recommendations are for brain injuries and pharmacology. So every four years, I believe, four or six years, all the preeminent experts in brain injury get together. The last one was in Berlin, and they make recommendations. There were a couple really important recommendations that came out of it, namely, don't sit in a room that's dark. Go out and have a little bit of sub-symptom exercise. That's gonna be your best outcome. But they found that there's no current pharmacological option for improving neurological outcomes in brain injury. This is the recommendations from the experts. All pharma interventions are related to symptom management specifically. But let's take a look at what there are actually, what evidence there actually is. One thing that's important is that when somebody's trying to return to learn or return to play and a person puts them on a treadmill and tries to get illicit symptoms, using medications can sometimes counteract that and interfere with the accuracy of that. So that's what Berlin came up with. Okay, for example, certainly Zoloft, there's some research showing that there was an improvement in depression scores, not very significant. Uh, amanitine, this is an NMDA receptor used in Parkinson's, and they found, again, positive negative study, potentially modulating cytotoxicity, we talked about that potential mechanism. Alzheimer medication, donzabazole, uh, short-term memory, improve short-term memory, but may have some long-term side effects. Acetylcholine is one neurotransmitter. It doesn't address all the picture. Ritalin, again, not very positive neuroprotective effects. They're real, again, the, the conclusion is, is there really was no protect, neuroprotective agent. So the symptomatic approach is really the way that majority of our colleagues work with. So here, and this is more for your reference, I'm not gonna go over it. Here are some medications that have some promise on some of the particular outcomes that I highlighted in the first section. Um, one, one study about statins that came out quite recently, statins, as you know, inhibit HMB co-reductase, which inhibits the formation of cholesterol. However, it also has some anti-inflammatory effects as well. We thought, let's put it to the test with brain injuries was very safe, was used right after an injury for seven days, but after 30 days, they found no difference after it. So again, working on one particular pathway, but didn't have that effect that, that they uh, thought. 